All right, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully we are recording this time. This is going to be my third time recording this video, so uh, that's fun. Anyways, uh, when I did my um, uh, second S-Fand versus... Actually, I need some water before I start this. Jeez. Okay, that's better. So when I did my S fan versus Rogue um, guide, the, the not not guide, uh, dueling tournament commentary, the second one, and we got to see S fan actually playing really well. Um, what we saw was ga the Rogue uh, doing deep gouge resets, like he was doing gouge reset, gouge reset, gouge reset, and he eventually wore down um, S fan with this. Now I did have a chance to talk to Jacova, and I did get a chance to it's just peace blade and me talking. Okay. Uh, I did get a chance to look, check out the paranoia to talk to Jacova and confirm that he did advise uh, S fan during the course of that duel and that the win condition was in fact um, for S fan to block the gouge. Is there some guy outside just honking like shut the fuck up um, was to block the gouge and subsequently get the uh, had the opportunity to k kill the rogue when the rogue uh, desperately wanted a reset. So, but the, con but the confusion came in mostly with how to use rank 1 consecration and to a lesser extent um, how to actually finish off the fight during, uh, against a rogue doing these annoying gouge resets uh, deep in the combat. Meaning that the rogue does not have vanish, the rogue does not have sprint, the rogue does not have blind, and the paladin uh, is basically uh, working off of his 45 second stun. Uh, and his um, his uh, bop, which tends to come off cooldown uh, much quicker. All right, so in, we're going to start off with the consecration tactics, with the, the one that was confusing people, because I kept saying that um, I, I kept wishing, I kept thinking um, S Fan was deep um, ret, and I, I was really hoping he had consecration because uh, I was trying to explain that consecration is another win condition uh, in this situation, which was uh, where some of the confusion was. But it really buys you time. The tactic I'm about to show you really buys you time. And we were recording, yes. Uh, the rogue's win condition under this situation is he wants to get on you as quickly as possible to eat and heal up and drink as quickly as possible. And then he, what he's looking for is a, a, an above average damage opener. So he's looking for, for good damage on his opener, like he gets lucky with his crits on an opener, and he catches you in a state where your cooldowns or your your outs are on, on cooldown. You don't have your six second stun, you don't have a grenade, you don't have um, your, your bop or your bubble, right? He's trying to catch you in that magical time where you don't have that stuff and you just freaking die. If you do have that stuff, he's just trying to, I guess he's trying to wear down your mana enough, which that usually doesn't work very well, as you can see in the S-Fan duel, to where um, he can he can kill you that way. But really, he's looking for the cooldowns. This is why uh, a lot of times with the higher level rogues, they might get the sap on you, um, and then they'll immediately start bandaging, eating, drinking, do, doing doing whatever the hell they have to do. I guess they don't drink, but whatever. But you'll often see them only like heal up to maybe 80 90 percent life before jumping on you again and the reason for that is because they're what the hell's going on outside uh they're being super mindful of this cooldown window that they desperately need to try to uh hit if they're if if, if they're to maintain that particular wind condition which is the only real wind condition that they have left at that point so um, what you do as the paladin to make sure that this win condition is completely nullified for the rogue is, especially if you have consecration, is you just throw down a rank one consecration, just like this. So in this scenario, uh, this is the last known location of the rogue. We saw the ro rogue go stealth here, right? And preferably, uh, like we see in the S-Fan duels, what we saw is the rogue ran away, and then the rogue turned and started running at us. And um, <clears throat> so we know he's coming, basically, before he went stealth. We saw him running towards us before he went stealth. He went stealth, and we're like, okay, I'm throwing down this rank one consecration. So what we do after we throw down the rank one consecration is we don't just sit in it. 
um, because a lot of really good rogues can actually get the sap off on us even if we're just sitting in the middle of our rank 1 consecration. Um, this is why I had to improve these tactics here in particular. Now, what I used to do is I throw down a rank one consecration and I would sit about here and start eating and drinking. And what this would cause, uh, is it would cause the rogue not to be able to dive in immediately and he'd either go north or, or I mean, south, yeah, north or south to try to get, close the distance before diving in on me to, um, try to get the the sap off and if my spider uh my spider senses would be tingling round about here when the rogue is here or so and i'd pick a, a direction i'd be like I'd, I'd have to guess i'd be like okay do i uh, run north run south flip a coin or do i keep running back to buy more time what do i do and nine times out of ten the answer was if i had space i would run back um if i didn't have space i would just flip a coin and and hope i picked the right direction but the, what i'm about to show you is vastly superior to any of that nonsense so what you do is you throw down the rank 1 consecration and then you immediately move right about here under, under these uh, conditions and you chill like here. And what this inevitably does, let's see if I can control Z that away, perfect, okay. Uh, what that inevitably does is it forces Senor Rogue, again we can't see him, but just ask yourself, is he going to take the, the southern route to get to us, to, to, to sap us? Or is he, he going to be taking the northern route to get to us and try to sap us? And the answer is he's going to be taking the northern route. So we're drinking here. We're eating, we're drinking, we're eating, we're drinking. Rogue gets to be about like here. Our spider senses will be going off and tingling. We head this direction first, then down. You like a, I like doing the jump twist. Like I'll jump twist this direction, then, then I'll head here, and I'll stop, uh, and I'll chill probably about here. Now, the reason why we do this little loop-de-loop -loop <clears throat> is we can be pretty damn sure that the rogue is closing in on us on the northern direction, and us going down here basically forces the rogue to have to decide where he's going to go. Does he go south to try to get to us? Or does he go this way to try to get to us? I guess that's counterclockwise. Or does he go clockwise to try to get to us? And, and again, we're trying to control which way that we uh, the rogue is going. So he's like, okay, it'll be quicker to go that way. I'm going to go this way to try to catch him. As, as you can see, we're buying a ridiculous amount of time here. Uh, when your spider senses start tingling again, um, and again, the rogue could be either here or the rogue could be here, probably by the time your spider senses tingle, uh, start tingling again, uh, just move out of the circle. Uh, move your happy little ass either directly south. That's probably the safest thing to do or, if you, if, uh, or angle this way a little bit and just reapply another circle of, of, of consecration uh, once that one wears off because it, it should be coming back off again. Like just just, just, just go ahead and, and, and pop her down uh, a second time. Um, round about this time, our rogue buddy will either be here or he will be here. Um, when you're putting down your second consecration, you really wanna try to overlap them. Like uh, try to think of it like a, a giant figure eight which is kind of what we got going on here, just to kind of guarantee that you're pretty sure the rogue's not in, in this area uh, to be 100% certain. Um, now, the last thing I'm going to mention before I explain uh, why, how many skill checks we're forcing the rogue to make is uh, once you put the consecration down here, uh, man maneuver either down or back a little bit, because again, the rogue's either going to be here, or the rogue's going to either be here. And again, we're forcing the rogue to, to circle around this next consecration circle to get to us, except this time we, we're starting to drastically lose track of, of where our prediction of the, of the rogue actually is. So um, you can't get down a third consecration circle, and neither would you really want to get down a third consecration circle. You've bought all the time in the world at this point that it, it really doesn't even matter. So the point I want to make here is at, during, in this second rank one consecration circle, this is an amazing time to use perception. <clears throat> if you're a human and you use perception, you pull back a little bit, you kind of wiggle around in this area, like, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. The reason why we're doing that is we're 110,000% we're sure the rogue is either coming this way or the rogue is coming that way. Um, and so we, we're just kind of um, seeing what we can see, trying to catch him with perception. If we do catch him with perception, we jump on him. He hasn't had a chance to heal or anything yet. He's still low life. Um, this could result in a kill, but um, we're going to go back a bit before I get too deep with the control Zs. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, that'll do. <clears throat> to explain just how many skill checks you're making this poor hunter make after I take a drink of water.
All right, so let's talk about the skill checks we're actually trying to make this rogue make here. <clears throat> all right, so when the, as we all know, um, okay, so what we all think is taking place is consecration uh, hits out farther. For, from our perspective as a paladin, uh, consecration hits out farther than the visual uh, on the ground um, shows it to be. Um, however, that's not true in my opinion. What's actually happening is that is that everybody has a fatter hitbox than they think they do, and Consecration is actually hitting precisely where the visual on the ground says it should be hitting. But due to the fact that we actually have fatter hitboxes that then, uh, than we think we do, um, when the rogue is trying to cut corners, like um, it, you're forcing a rogue in the grand scheme of things to run all the way around the edge of this circle, right? Then the paladin moves and put down another consecrate, so then he's closing in on the second consecration circle, and he has to run all the way around again. Um, all this running around the edge of the consecration circle, especially since as it gets more and more frustrating for the rogue, um, they'll often try to cut corners and get closer and closer to, to the consecration circle, and you'll be utterly surprised at how often they fuck it up because their hitbox is faster, uh, fatter than they think it is, especially with horde rogues who aren't really used to uh, the, the whole consecration uh, dueling paladin scenario, or fighting paladin scenario for that matter, and they'll often uh, uh, get clipped um, and, and, and take a tick from the consecration because they're too fat and uh, they're, they're not respecting the consecration circle, and uh, that can actually be a really big deal because you can go, aha, rogue decloaked. I'm going to jump on him. So that's skill check number one. Uh, skill check number two, and this is this is nine times out of ten where you end up catching the the, the really good uh, rogue players. The ro the really good rogue players won't really screw up. Uh, they'll respect the dueling circle. But uh, nine times out of ten, if you're going to catch them, this is the scenario that happens. So we're like sitting here <clears throat> eating, drinking, and keep in mind that. Um, where this happens particularly is when we're here eating and drinking or we're here eating and drinking. This is, this is the two times this typically happens. And what happens in this scenario is our rogue stealthed, he's going north, he's coming, he, he's hugging the dueling circle, but he's respecting it. Or my bad, the dueling circle, the consecration circle, but he's respecting it. They get to about here and they're like, I can make that distance. And then they dive into the circle to try to get the sap off. However, our spider senses uh, kind of went off roundabout. And if you recall, I, I suggested you do that jump away loop-de-loop -loop and then start moving south. Well, if this guy started going in on the circle to close to you and he got unlucky enough that you, your spider senses just went off roundabout that time and you're moving away and coming down, he's going to get uh, caught by the consecration, right? Like you will you will all of a sudden just see a rogue like decloak like here or decloak like here if they kept pressing. If they tried to get out, they might decloak like right here. And you're like, what the fuck? And you can just turn around and jump all over them and do terrible things to them. Um, that happens either here typically or it happens here typically when, when you're eating and drinking. So those are the major skill checks that you're forcing the, the rogue to make under these conditions. However, by far the most important thing here is that you're buying for yourself so much freaking time for, for everything to come off cooldown that the rogue's win condition of catching you outside when you don't have your cooldowns with a, with a good RNG opener is pretty much utterly pushed off the table. And as this persists, you'll see the rogue getting more and more frustrated and become more and more desperate to dive into that circle as soon as possible to try to get that sap off on you. And it becomes ever more risky for them. So the last thing I want to talk about in this video, are we still recording, please, for the love of God, um, is how to actually close out a duel under these conditions. And the answer is uh, mugger hurt. Like, that, that, that is legitimately uh, the answer. Uh, there, there are other things you can do. Like, you can have, um, since you were buying all the time in, in the world for, for this, you had plenty of time to swip, switch to whatever trinkets that you wanted. And at this point, you could pick your poison in trinkets to kill the rogue the next time you, you get the chance to kill the rogue, especially if you catch them out in, like, a perception or, or they, they screw up or stuff. So, like, like, PvP trinket, goblin mortar, grenade. Like, how, how the fuck is he, is he going to survive that kind of a scenario? Um, 
Like, oh, I'm going to gouge and reset. Okay, I trinket it. Oh, shit. Uh, that, that's not so good. He's still beating on me. Okay, I got to wait a few seconds. I'm going to gouge him again and try to get some more distance. Oh, I didn't get very far. Oh, shit. Here comes a mortar. Oh, shit. I'm stunned. Now he's on me again. Oh, fuck. You get the point, right? <clears throat> um, however, Mugga Hurt, to be perfectly honest, is your boy here. And I'm about to show why. Let's delete all this stuff real fast. Delete. Delete, delete, delete. And that's to do with just raw math. You guys can pick out a calculator and, and, and do the math yourself if you want to. But um, the moral of the story is that the standard movement speed for a, a character in classic World of Warcraft is 8 yards a second, plus like the 8 movements, uh, percent movement speed bonus or whatever that you get from uh, movement speed enchant on boots. So it turns out to be like, I think it's like, it's like 8 point, what is that? That's, that's 50... Uh, uh yeah it's it's about 8.6 yards a second we'll say <clears throat> one second need another drink of water all right so there's two types of gouges that a rogue can hit you with gouge has like four second duration they can either get you with a four second gouge or they can get you with a two second gouge because uh they, they had some dr going basically right um, you forced them to go for the reset so quickly that the stun is still on DR, and subsequently they have to hit you with a two-second gouge as opposed to a four-second gouge. That's ideal, but it's also not necessary, and, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So in S-Fan's duels, he was putting enough pressure on the rogue that he was suffering from two-second gouges. But I'm about to, um, <clears throat> which is which is why his win condition of I block a gouge, I win is completely viable. Whereas if he was suffering the four second gouge, um, the situation, I think gouge has got like a six second cooldown. If you haven't noticed, I don't know fuck all about, uh, about rogues because I usually don't care because I just kill them. Um, when, I, when I start recording uh, dueling videos, especially you're going to see the level of, of, of zero shits given I have when I'm dueling even rank 14 rogues. It's, it's utterly insane. So uh, what was I getting at? All oh, right. So... Um, <clears throat> That was why S fans win condition of a, he blocks a gouge, he wins. If he if it was the four second gouge, the rogue might have been able to make it to another gouge and blah, 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 blah. So there's some advantage to having increased uh, DPS under these conditions. But what I'm about to say is, what if this rogue is, is, is mugger hurt slowed? What if he's got the, the, the million year minus 50% movement speed slow? What, what is, what does gouge reset look like under those conditions? And the answer is, well, there's really only two. Let's get black and let's get white. Mm, black and white wool. Black and about half that distance, actually, yeah. Boop. Okay. So the top one we'll say is the four-second gouge. So I want a four and an S, bada-bing. And I want a two and an S, bada-bing. Okay, so we'll say the top one is the distance that the rogue can cover when he is four seconds uh, uh, stunning you, and this bottom one is the distance they can cover when he is two seconds stunning you. So normally a rogue on a two second stun, we can do the math. Um, if he was not slowed, he can get away from you, let me think, that's about 17 yards. He can get away from you 17 yards, That that is more than enough distance for him to to get the reset he he's he's out of everything but holy shock at that range basically right um you can try to grenade him but get it, getting a grenade off on a skilled rogue who's watching de uh specifically for you trying to grenade him at that range is, is not the easiest thing in the world to do and uh, i think theoretically he might just be able to like grenade you back but nah, he's got too much dr with with with, with the, the seconds um with a four second stun, he's a million years away, right? Like he's just gone. For, forget about Nade. Forget about everything else. See, he, he's he's got the reset, no problem. But what about Mugga Hurt? Well, if he could have traveled seventeen yards in, do, is this numbers? No, it's not. Um, well, if he could have traveled seventeen yards in two seconds, now he's only traveling half of that, which is like eight point five yards. Yeah, so you travel, you'll, you'll be like eight point five yards away. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but uh, that's pretty much, uh, that's definitely within judgment range to keep him in combat. That's within uh, Hand of Justice stun range. That's within, uh, almost within freaking melee range of all damn things. 
So um, the two-second stun, <clears throat> if the guy is slowed, especially if he's got more, which he which he's almost always has, right? When you get the Mugahertz uh, uh, stun on some or slow on somebody, it usually lasts like quite a chunk of time. Um, any extra amount of slow, once the Paladin comes out of... Once the Paladin comes out of the stun, I'm trying to say if the Rogue is still slowed and the Paladin has time to run after him, he's going to be closing on the Rogue at a speed of about 4.3 4 um, yards a second, right? This becomes important when we look at the 4 second one because the 4 second one is going to be literally double this, which is going to be 17 yards. Come on, bro. 17... Okay, so the four second one is 17 yards. The two second one is only 8.5 yards. The 8.5 yards, we're pretty much good to go. Like within one second of us closing on this rogue, we're going to be within melee range. The rogue's only going to be like four yards away from us. We are happy, happy campers. We're just, it didn't even matter. He, he, the, the reset is a non-factor. Um, he can't gouge us again, right? Because he, he already, uh, the, the, a third gouge, I guess, would be like one second. Again, I have no um, uh, idea what, what the cooldown on a gouge is. I know it costs like 45 energy, but past that, I have no idea. Um, on the 17 second one, uh, here's where things get interesting. Um, we still need to close on this rogue for like a little over, uh, for, for at least two seconds to keep him in combat. If we close on him for two seconds, that'll be 17 minus, let me think, 4.3, 17 minus, 8.6. Yeah, so we'll be within uh, judgment range. So as long as we still had at least two seconds of slow on this rogue, then we can easily reclose with the rogue and keep him in combat before he gets another gouge up. And then if there was even more time, like we could have just hodged him and then closed the distance. But if there was anything over... Um, if there was anything over two seconds, that we're just we're just going to close within melee range, no problem. And you can easily start seeing how um, Mugga hurt under these uh, circumstances is basically death to to this tactic of of rogue resetting. Um, now the last thing to talk about here is when to go Mugga hurt. Now I'm a big fan of of sitting in my most viable dueling weapon against a rogue when we're doing the toe-to-toe -to -toe thing before the rogue goes for the reset up until about uh, three hits before uh, before I, I'm, I'm picturing the, the rogue is going to want to reset. So I might like sit in Edward the Odd, for example, or a Flurry Axe or a Deathbringer or whatever I've got on hand, a Wailing on this rogue, and um, uh, maybe like five seconds or so before I think the rogue's going to go for a reset, like I'm sensing the reset's going to be coming here soon, I'll switch into a Mug of Hurt and hopefully get like three auto attacks in, in, into the rogue before the rogue tries to go for the reset. Um, this gives me uh, three 16% chances, so like a 48% chance that I, I'm getting some kind of slow on him. I'm either getting the 10 second slow, that would be a 30% chance, or there's an 18% chance I get the uh, the, the chili weapon, uh, weapon effect um, proc on him. And in either case, you can see that once that slow gets on the rogue, um, the option for the rogue to do the gouge reset is now no longer there. The rogue literally has to say to himself, I can't gouge, I am slowed, I need to stay in combat with this paladin a little longer and pray to God that the slow falls off of me. If that's the 10 second slow, then, then God help you. But um, from there, you're basically just sticking in Mugga Hurt until the rogue fucking dies. And uh, you can be pretty, pretty, pretty assured that if you get that, that slow off, that the rogue will in fact just die. And um, that is essentially how you deal with, with the rogue resets. Um, if if S-Fan had uh, swapped from his Thunder Fury to a, a, a Mugga Hurt, um, round about when the rogue was, oh, like 70% life uh, fighting him, he would have drastically increased his, his possibility of a win condition as opposed to just relying on uh, a 20%-ish, approximately 20%-ish chance to block the gouge. 
um, type scenario. So um, yeah, so that, that's that's my final. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say uh, about this particular phase of the matchup. Um, your win conditions uh, uh, to, to summarize are: um, uh, you can block the gouge; that's a viable win condition. You can uh, trinket swap into more appropriate things; that's a viable win condition. Um, you can try to catch the rogue uh, with it, with with multiple skill checks. Um, and rank one consecration, that's also a viable win condition, at which point he's like, he's already low life, he might be like 40% life, he fucks up the, the consecration check, you just jump on him with, with, with your stuns, you start beating on him, you, you, you whip out the mug of hurt, he's like, oh fuck, I need to gouge this guy, and you get away, and you might get like two hits of mug of hurt on him before he does the gouge, and, and he tries to, 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 to run away from you. And um, there's that chance for slow again, so that that's another uh, possible win condition. Especially if you if you had your stun up, you like stun him, you beat on him a bit with Mugger Hurt, and it's like, oh shit. Um, what are the other win conditions? I don't think I missed anything. There's the skill check. The, oh the, yeah, there's just the straight Mugger Hurt, which is you, you just go into a Mugger Hurt, and suddenly this it just it just ends. Like the, the odds, yeah, it's, he, he's, the rogue is done, basically. And for this reason, since you can pretty much guarantee that you can win with a mug of hurt during this, uh, you, you can buy the time you need, and you can um, eventually get the, 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 the mug of hurt slow, and you can finish out the duel. This is why I'm a huge fan of dueling against a rogue in a manner where you make yourself nigh unkillable against them, and um, you just enter this, this very late stage fight, and then you 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 just rely on your mug of hurt and a little bit of this well, exactly what I'm saying in this video here and and you just win the day. So anyways, yeah, I I hope you enjoyed this. I'll uh, definitely continue to try to get the proper gear at least up to a decent standard where I can at least show you some duels. Like I, I got five piece now, but I don't have five piece enough that I could actually duel a rogue and show you guys. Because um, uh, I have the chest, and I really want Demon Forge Breastplate against Rogues. So I'd be like a four-piece uh, T2 with a Demon Forge Breastplate, and my brain's just like, oh god, please give me the five-piece. I want the five-piece. Ah! Um, I have dueled rank 14 Rogues. One sec, there's like some stupid... I don't know what this is, but I'm going to deal with it real fast. Eh. All right. Some bug crawling around on my wall. Um... What was I saying? Rank 14. Yeah, I have du dueled rank 14 rogues with uh, the Demon Forge Breastplate and the Skull Flame Shield and the Uther Strength uh, Insignia. And it does go long enough for me to get in these deep dueling scenarios. But what I've noticed is since I don't have five piece um, T2, um, I don't quite do enough damage. Um, and I still don't have all plate gear with spell power on it, which is another big issue. So there, the, the damage they do to me is so significant that I can't actually start doing the whole, um, stopping to flash of light thing that I really like to do, which, 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 uh, cuts out a, a lot of the rogues damage, uh, because they're just putting too much pressure on me. Um, and uh, let me think. I'd say in my current gear level, I've only got a 50-50 win rate against uh, rank 14 geared rogues. Uh, that is going to change very, very rapidly once I start uh, stacking on more T2 and I get to start uh, dropping these pieces of mail and plate gear that are still from like Strath Undead and freaking... Uh, uh, a BRD, <laughs> like I got BRD shoulders, and then I've got like Strath, uh, Strathholm male gauntlets and freaking belt, <laughs> and the stats on them are just terrible for dueling a rogue. Like they got spell power, but they're just absolutely terrible. And I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm not making a video yet. I'm not, I'm not going against rank 14 rogues and being like, hey, check this out. If I was better geared, I would have won. Nah, I'll just give it a few weeks and I'll make some videos later. And you will see, you will see the level of no shits given that I have uh, against uh, rogues um, in T2. Uh, uh, rank 14 be damned. So anyways, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm probably going to make some more videos today. <clears throat> oh, voice cracking at the very last. Probably make some more uh, dueling videos. Um, let me think. S-Fan was performing quite well in, 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 in the duel yesterday, so I'm actually quite excited to see uh, how he does against some other 
in some other matchups, especially since he's not deep ret and he's ret reckoning. And ret reckoning in duels kind of fascinates me for the win conditions because I have very little experience with ret reckoning in duels. Um, so we'll we'll see what he does. He does have hand of rag, so maybe maybe that's just the way to go. But yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go check it out. That's what I'm gonna go do. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, this is my third freaking time recording this, so I'm just gonna just gonna end it there. Yeah.